Welcome to Centre Church. We hope you enjoy this message recorded live from our Burgess Hill campus. We want to thank God this morning and I am convinced in my heart God has placed a word in my heart which is a word for this season and for this time. And I pray that even as I share uh, that God would help me to bring a challenge to the church, but at the same time be able to present that challenge in a, in a, gra in a gracious way, in a gracious way. Praise the Lord. Um, we are continuing uh, in the series that was started a few weeks ago, First Things First. And uh, we've had um, a few messages. I think I'm not connected, am I? <laughs> okay, praise God. We've had a few messages already on that series, First uh, Things First. Last week, we had a beautiful message about changing our seats. And I just thought, um, that is uh, something that needs to be done first. If you are facing some things that seem not to budge, that seem not to give in, sometimes the starting point, the first thing to, to do is to change your seat. Praise the Lord. And the, uh, and the other week, Tom shared about um, worship, adapting worship uh, as a lifestyle. But today, I, um, I just want to bring something. Let me bring you to uh, your attention to the message that launched us into this series, which Tom shared a few weeks ago from the prophet Haggai. A pe uh, he read from chapter 1, a people of God who were expecting to see God do great things among them. But because of the things that they had neglected, they had neglected some things that were of great importance at that time. And as a result, they became unable to experience the fullness of what God was able to do or could be able to do among them. And the, prop, the word that was uh, given to them is unless those things that have been neglected are fixed. Some of the problems that they were experiencing and some of the challenges will probably continue to be there. So the starting point, the actual question that was to be addressed is what is it that is being neglected? Praise God. Just bringing that here and now. You know, I've been meditating on that word, believe you me or not, I've been meditating on that word over these weeks, and I was asking myself, what is it that I have neglected in my life that I don't experience the fullness of what the Bible promises concerning God and what God can do? What have I neglected? What have we neglected as families? What have we neglected collectively as a church, even as the body of Christ? More still, as a nation, what is it that we have neglected? That some of the things that we experience, we wonder, why is God not acting on our behalf? in these situations. The question that I want us to keep uh, allowing to, uh, uh, you know, to sink in us is what is it that we have neglected? Because God's grace is abundant to pick us up and to help us fix those things that we have neglected in order to experience the fullness of God's power. I was thinking through the generations that have come. You see, the Bible says God is the same. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is as powerful today as he was in the days of, uh, in the days of Peter and John, in the days of the, of the first apostles. He is as powerful as he was in the days of the, of the early church, in the generations and the centuries that have gone. God has not changed. He is still as powerful and he is still as loving and willing to move among his people. But what is it that he has changed when we look back at uh, Peter and John? They would walk to the temple, the Bible says in Acts chapter 3. They see a man sitting by the, by the beautiful gate who has never been able to walk. And they look at him and say, we give you what we have in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And the man stands up and they start to walk. Those people who have a bit of their medical background, you realize when you don't use your leg muscles for a long time, it's almost, they lose their strength and it's almost impossible to walk. But in the name of Jesus, all that was, um, you know, like uh, overridden and he rose up and he walked. We 
We, we hear about uh, how, uh, Paul and, how Paul and Silas were stuck in, the pre in prison for preaching the message of the cross, the message of Jesus. But while they were there, they lifted their voices and started to worship God. And the Bible tells us that the gates were miraculously opened and they walked out. We are talking about that is the same God that we still serve today. We hear about the century just drawing it close to our time. The evangelists of the centuries that have just gone, we talk about, uh, we, we hear about D.L. Moody, I read about him a lot, uh, and his, uh, Moody was an American evangelist from the 19th century. He was known for carrying the power of God. I read something that when Moody was in the town, walking around even in the mall, people would be falling in the power of the Holy Spirit. Miracles would be happening. He was walking, carrying the power and the presence of God that could not be stopped or obstructed by anything. He is the same God that we serve today. We hear about um, uh, people like, uh, bring it here to England. We hear about Smith Wigglesworth. He was one of um, powerful uh, evangelists. I, I've read that uh, he used to he he was uh, he he used to go even in hospitals, uh, laying hands on the sick, sometimes praying even for dead people, and they would come back to life. One of the most profound testimony about him that I've heard uh, is that uh, when his wife died, uh, he felt he felt. Uh, uh, destroyed inside because he needed her, he, he needed his wife, and he says he prayed over her wife who was dead, and prayed and cried out and say, "I need her back. I still need my wife." And uh, the story says. Uh, the wife opened her eyes. This is somebody who was dead. Opened their, her, her eyes and looked at him and said, Honey, God needs me more. And, he clo and she closed her eyes and died again. It sounds creepy. It sounds weird. But what challenges me about this story, it's, it's not the weirdness of everything, but it's the faith and the trust and confidence in God that he carried as he walked around. We can go on and on. People like uh, John G. Uh, G. Lacker, we hear that uh, he carried a healing anointing, that when he walked through the cities, things were happening to an extent that they would be looking for him, uh, journalists to interview him, because the city was completely healed. If no one was sick, he was moving in the power of God. And the question that I ask is, uh, he is the same God. From the time of the uh, D.L. Moody's uh, and the Wiggles Smith uh, and the Wiggles uh, Worth and, and all these people I'm sharing. But what has changed with our generation? That we seem so uh, dry and we are so hungry and things seem not to happen. What is it uh, that we have neglected? When I looked at this and I was meditating on it, uh, I realized that there is one common denominator that was prominent in the lives uh, of these people, right from the, the first apostles, the, uh, the first apostles, the early church, uh, to all these evangelists of the uh, uh, se uh, probably one or two centuries ago, they relied on prayer as though their life was anchored on prayer, as though if they don't pray, they would not breathe, they would not live. Prayer was central to each and every one of them. When we look at Peter and John, we hear, we hear often it would say, while they were going into the temple, in the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and instantly I realized that they had a scheduled time to pray. When the time to pray has come, everything goes at a standstill, and it's time to be with the Lord. It's it's time to hear from the Lord. It's time for prayer. One of the common um, quotes from uh, D.L. Moody is that uh, he who kneels the most stands the best. In other words, he who stands spends more time on their knees crying out and praying to the Lord. They will be able to stand up the best in this life. They will be able to move with the best of God in this life. And... Um, uh, John Wesley, one of, uh, one of them from the centuries gone, one of his quotes, it says, nothing happens unless somebody prays. He insisted that uh, 
God does not do anything except in response to prayer. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth was asked one day, uh, how long do you pray? And he said, you, the question shouldn't be how long do you pray, but how long do you go without praying? And he said, I hardly go for 20 minutes without prayer. In other words, he was saying, wherever I go, whatever I am doing, whoever I am with, I carry an atmosphere of prayer around me. I constantly remind myself to be praying, to be connecting with God to be bringing God around everything that I am doing. So when I looked at this, I started to ask and I say, could prayer be the one thing that our generation has neglected? Could prayer be the one thing that can reignite that fire in our generation? Could prayer be uh, uh, that very thing that we need to bring back in perspective? I know sometimes we'll be saying, but we do pray. Of course we do pray. Maybe I should put it like this. Maybe our generation has taken a complacent attitude towards prayer. When God wants us to be fired up and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit as we connect with him in prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, prayer is connecting and talking to God. It's connecting and communicating with God. Prayer is, is, a, is not primarily about telling God what we need and telling God what we want and telling God what he should do. But it's more about connecting with God and getting to understand what is it that God requires of my life and what is it that God wants me to do with this life and then come in alignment with that. Of course, we bring our supplications to God in prayer. Prayer. And we tell God what we need, but the bottom line is to hear what has got God to say so that we come in alignment with that. Prayer is a powerful weapon against the enemy. You know, when the enemy is rising up against us, whether individually or collectively, it is in the place of prayer that we can overcome or that we can defeat the enemy. The Queen of Scotland is quoted, the Queen of Scotland from the 16th century is quoted to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than the um, armies of Europe assembled. In other words, you know, the, the greatest place to win a battle is in the place of prayer. Yes, wars can happen, but that's the manifestation of what God has already accomplished in the place of prayer. Praise the Lord. Now, neglecting prayer is a dangerous thing for us as Christians, because it is in prayer, number one, I did say, where we connect with God. So prayer, prayer channels us and keeps us connected with God. It is in the place of prayer that we get to know God. It is in the place of prayer that we connect and get to understand the will of God for our lives. It is in the place of prayer that we get to know his ways, that we get to know and understand the heart of God. It is in the place of prayer that we are transformed and changed into the image of Christ. Because in prayer, we gaze on the beauty of God and we gaze on his goodness. When you come to the place of prayer, you just sit and you talk to God and you soak in God. You know, I was just thinking and I thought, you know, it's just like if you want your tea, if you want your boiling water to become tea, and you want your boiling water uh, to become, to have the flavor of tea. When you, you take the tea bag and place it in the boiling water, the longer the tea bag stays in the hot water, the more the tea becomes strong. If you want the flavor to be strong, let it abide in the cup of boiling water a little longer. And I think this is the same with us. The more time we spend in prayer, the more we become like God, the more we become a strong stronger and powerful as God is, the longer we stay there, the more we produce the flavor of God everywhere that we will go. Praise the Lord. So prayer is a channel of connecting with God. In fact, John 15 says, abide in me and I in you. It, there is that abiding in each other that gives us the power and that happens in the place of prayer. Number two, we cannot abandon, we cannot um, be complacent about prayer because uh, it is the system of complete dependence. You know, if we want to see great things happen, 
We better depend on God 100%. It's good to strategize. It's good to work out things and ideas and set goals and everything. That is great. But it is even greater to have the Holy Spirit help strategize together with you and hear what he says and strategize in line with what the Spirit of God is, is saying. So it's complete dependence on God. Praise the Lord. I pray that uh, we are moving together, moving really fast because of time. <laughs> you know, um, so it's a place of complete dependence. I choose, though I know how to do this thing, but I'm going to do it with God anyway. Though I understand uh, the explanation around these things, but I choose to do them with God. Because God, I, when you say com a system of dependence, is I wake up in the morning and I know everything that I'm going to do today, I'm going to do with God. Because on my own, I, can, I cannot do much. But in God, I am strengthened and I have got wisdom. So he is my joy. He is my strength. He is my strong tower. He is the foundation on which I stand. When something comes to shake me, I remember I'm standing on the rock. And this rock cannot be moved. That is complete dependence. Nothing threatens you because when it comes, it threatens you a bit. But you remember, I depend on God who is almighty, who cannot be be shaken, who does not change, but who is almighty. And you know what? For you to be able to experience that and to speak those things with boldness, it happens in the place of prayer. When we neglect prayer, we feel like we are hanging in the air. Everything threatens us. Everything uh, throws us into panic. Everything. Because you feel alone. But when you realize in the place of prayer, uh, I demonstrate the connectedness with God. It is in that place of prayer where I am complete. I know I'm completely dependent on God. That helps us to stand even when challenges comes. Does that mean challenges don't come? They still come, but when they come, their impact or effect on your being is gonna be diffused by the power of God because He is the mighty God. So number one, I said. Uh, we can't neglect prayer because uh, that is how we connect with God and get to know God and become like God and walk in the same power that uh, God is. Uh, number two, it's a system of complete dependence. And when we know we completely depend on the almighty God, we'll be able to stand even when the hardest storm hits our life. Number three, prayer is warfare. The word of God in John 10.10, 10, it says the enemy comes not but to steal to kill and to destroy. And elsewhere, the word of God says that the devil is like a rolling lion moving up and about, seeking whom to devour or whom to destroy or whom to mess up. That is what the devil does. He's looking to mess up the good things that God is building. When God is starting something great with you, the enemy wants to come and contaminate it and make it look ugly. When initially, God started it as a beautiful thing. So it is in the place of prayer that we stand our ground against the enemy. That it is in the place of prayer that we declare that we are victors. You see, the word of God says, it is for this reason that the Son of God was manifested, that he may destroy all the works of darkness. But it is only in the place of prayer that we can be able to confidently stand and declare and release the power of God in stubborn situations and they bow. Ephesians, in a writing to Ephesians, Apostle Paul says uh, uh, to the church, uh, remember your battles are not against flesh and blood. What you see is not the real thing, but it's against the principalities and powers, uh, forces of darkness that the enemy unleashes uh, to contaminate beautiful things uh, that God is building. Unless we rise up in that place of prayer and stand and declare the word of God. The enemy will kick us left, right, and center. We remain hungry and question why is not God acting, but God is calling us to a place high 
where we stand and declare and release his word over situations. Praise God. There are some things that have challenged us, troubled us, squashed us, drained us, you know, which are of the enemy messing us around. But God is calling us to that place of prayer where our prayer life is reignited to a place where we speak and we declare and the enemy stands no chance. You see, the enemy knows already that he is defeated, but he takes advantage of our complacence and he can mislead us and he can play with our mind left, right and center that we forget who we are in Christ Jesus. But let us be reminded in the place of prayer, as we connect with God, as we drink from God, as we soak in God, that is when we are reminded on who we are and we have got to stand our grounds and to defeat the enemy. Praise the Lord. You know, the enemy is up and about. He is busy because he knows he's already defeated. So he is busy seeking whom to deceive or to devour. So he's, he releases curses all the time. I curse, I curse this marriage, I curse the children, I curse this church. But because we are children of God and we are under the blood of Jesus, those curses cannot hold. But when we become complacent and move away from that place of prayer where our strength is, the enemy can take advantage of that situation. But I just sense God is calling us back to that place where we, where we stand in that authority and in that power through Jesus Christ and move as, as uh, overcomers, not only for our individual lives, but also for the body of Christ at large and also for, uh, for our nation. We can see even in our nation, there are some things we are thinking, what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? The enemy is messing things up. But the church is being called to arise. Because when we arise in prayer, the power of God will be seen even in our nation. Praise God. It's dangerous to take a complacent attitude towards prayer. And the other thing is prayer is a, a prayer empowers us to move in the supernatural. It is in the place of prayer that we are empowered to move in power, to move in authority, to move in the supernatural. The word of God says in um, uh, Jeremiah 33 verse 3, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. There are things that we don't know that God is willing to bring to our knowledge and to our awareness, and even how to solve those things. But that is found in the place of prayer. And in this scripture, the Jeremiah 33 that I just read, God invites us to pray. He says, call to me, and I will show you. He's giving a promise. When we call, he will answer. When we call, he will respond, and he will respond by showing us great things that we don't know. That is the miraculous things that we have not experienced. The supernatural things that we have not uh, experienced. I want us to realize God has given us spiritual gifts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, Apostle Paul teaches on spiritual gifts. And he says they were given for us to profit. It's for our benefit that we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. But the gifts of the Spirit are awakened in the place of prayer. Because some of us, we carry such powerful gifts of the Spirit, but we don't move in those gifts. Why? Probably because there is a neglect in prayer that has happened. It is in the place of prayer that we awaken those gifts. There are prophets among us, but they won't prophesy because the gift has been buried and buried under the troubles, the worries, the fears, the anxieties of this world. But in the place of prayer, those layers are peeled off and peeled off and the prophet will arise from inside you. They are healers here that God has anointed with the healing ministry but it's buried under because sometimes of the pain and the things that we have experienced over the years but I sense that God wants to awaken some gifts. God wants to awaken this church because they are gifted people here who love God who fear God but we need Need to fend up the fire of prayer, and that happens in the place of prayer. I 
want you to hear me, people of God. God speaks, the Bible speaks, the gifts of prophets, the gifts of healing, working of miracles. It talks about all those, the, the, the weight of knowledge, the weight of wisdom. We carry them in here. All of them are here packaged in this place. Why are we not flowing in those gifts? They are buried under a lot of other things. Maybe it's painful experiences. Maybe doubt crept when things were happening over the years. Or maybe we have just become dry and complacent when it comes to seeking God in prayer. But I sense an awakening moving in this place. This could be it, people of God. This could be God declaring revival. It's coming to England when we choose to rise up in that place of prayer and allow the spirit of God to move in our midst. You know, prayer ought to be sincere. Sincere, it means it's coming from the heart because God, uh, God does not look on the outside performance. He looks at the intentions of the heart. What is the heart caring? He looks at the heart. So when the heart is genuinely seeking God, the outside will manifest what is in the heart and that is what God looks at. Prayer ought to be sincere. Here. Praise God. Just three things. I'll just uh, read them out because I'm out of time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, I said prayer needs to be sincere. That is from the heart. When I say from the heart, I mean uh, what we pray on the outside should be in alignment with what we carry in the heart. That is a sincere prayer, which means you cannot pray in power and authority and live in hate and bitterness and anger. It doesn't work. We cannot pray in power and authority and continue to hold grudges in our hearts. There is an forgiveness that needs to happen so that our prayers become sincere prayers. Praise God. So sincerity, which is um, authenticity in prayer. The second thing is um, prayer needs to be consistent. I think I've touched on that already. Prayer needs to be consistent. We don't have to go in and out. Uh, I'm on fire these days. I'm in the spirit. Now I'm out. I'm in the flesh. We have got to stay in the spirit. Consistent. Apostle Paul teaches that. Uh, pray without ceasing. Does it mean that you don't leave the prayer room? No. It means that wherever you are, whatever you say, your confessions, everything about you, they are a prayer. You know the prayers that we pray when we are gathered here or that we pray when we are at home. Every word that we speak, it doesn't end when you say amen. When you say amen, you get on with your life. But whatever words you continue to speak bears witness to your prayer. Whatever you continue to confess bears witness to your prayer. Sometimes we have prayed powerful prayers and we felt God moved. But we walked out of the prayer room and started to undo the prayer by speaking with doubt and unbelief automatically moving away from that consistency in prayer. Prayer has got to happen in the prayer room and go through the day in that atmosphere, that confession of prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Number, and then prayer, number three, I said consistency, I said uh, sincere, and now uh, pray the word of God. Pray the word of God. You know, it's good to pray what is in our heart. But when we have finished the pouring before God what is in our heart, let's step at what his word says and start to declare those things in our prayers. When you pray the, when you pray the word of God, you are saying, let it be on earth, in my life, in my household, as it is in heaven. Because God has given those promises through his word. And we can hold God on his word and release those promises as we speak them out. Praise the Lord. If the word of God says a man who fears God is blessed, a man who does not sit in the seat of evil and the scornful is blessed, they shall be like trees planted by the rivers. When challenges are coming and you are going through a season of drought, you must be able to say, Father, I, my life is surrendered to you. I am somebody who does not sit in the council of the ungodly. Now I declare your promises. I shall be like trees planted by the rivers. I will bear fruit. We will pray it over ourselves, over our households, even over the body of Christ. It is God's promise. It is God's promise in his word. And he is faithful to fulfill what he says. And the fourth and the last thing, uh, prayer. We need, we, prayer has to be in the spirit. Pray
dying in the spirit. I understand, you know, some of them, have, uh, some of us, we have received the gift of uh, 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 praying in tongues, speaking in tongues. Some of us, we have not. If you haven't, it's okay. All God wants is a heart that is uh, open and say, God, in your time. Oh, I also want this gift of being able to pray in the spirit. Why is it important to be able to pray in the spirit? Because the word of God tells us, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, uh, it, it says, uh, he w- is that the right verse? Give me a minute. <laughs> yeah, um, 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's verse 2. In fact, verse 2 says, he who speaks in a tongue, speaks to God, and speaks mysteries. So when you are praying in tongues, you are not praying, you are not speaking to men. You are not speaking to anybody. You are speaking direct to God. Nobody understands what you are saying except for God. Even the devil himself is confused left, right, and center. He doesn't know what you are on about. But you are firing prayer in the spirit. And when you go further down, this is First Corinthians chapter 14. When you go further down, um, uh, verse 14 would say, when you pray uh, in, a, in a tongue, your spirit prays. So that is why it's important as well for prayer to be rendered in the spirit. It says, uh, your spirit prays. Do you know the advantage of your spirit prays? Because most of the time, our minds get on the way. Our minds bring doubt and question what God is doing and saying. But when we are, when you start to pray in the spirit, uh, your spirit is uttering mysteries to God. Uh, you don't even understand sometimes uh, until he gives you the interpretation. But you are speaking direct to God. Then Apostle Paul would say, I speak in tongues more than you all. More than you all. And at one point he says, I think it's verse 14 and 15 of the same First Corinthians chapter 14. He says, sometimes I, I pray with the understanding, which means I pray in my own language. But then sometimes I also pray in the spirit. Then he says, sometimes I sing in my understanding, but sometimes I also sing in the spirit. Let me say to you, people of God, if God has given you the gift of uh, praying in tongues, uh, pray in tongues, because the Bible says you are edifying yourself. In other words, you are building up your faith when you pray in tongues. If you haven't, it's still okay because God sees the prayer that you are already rendering through his word and in the fullness of time, he will give you, he will give you that blessing. I just sense that God wants to do something fresh. There are things sometimes that have hindered the move of God that have we hindered the manifestation of the miraculous. But I sense in this season, there is something fresh that God wants to do. There is something that is breaking because God is raising his church to be a giant in a time of challenge, in a time when the enemy is being exalted above God, where people would rather talk about the devil and people think it's okay. But when you talk about Jesus, People think it's weird. What has gone wrong? We have got to come back to the place of prayer. I just sense God wants to awaken some gifts that have been lying idle. Some people who have been discouraged by life, buried down by the happenings of life. I sense God is digging up some people that we operate in our callings, in our anointings, in our giftings, and we will see God do greater and mighty things among us. Praise the Lord. Thank you for watching this week's message. For any more information or to find out more of what we do as a church, you can contact us at info at centerchurch.uk or check out our website at www.centre-church.uk.